Ladies and gentlemen, once again, you are all cordially welcome to our lecture for today. Today promises to be one of the interesting details of linear programming. Now, we have been learning about linear programming by now, and associated with any primal model is the dual. Now, the models we have learned, there is known as a primal mention it, but because we are now going to do a comparison with the dual, I'm now bringing the difference clearer. Every primal model has a dual. I'll give you an example. For example, we have a simultaneous equation, elimination method, and substitution method. Each one has a way of arriving at a solution in a very nice way. In data envelopment analysis, we have the envelopment model and the multiplier model. These are kind of equivalent. And that is the same thing. Duality is important because it guides us into giving us some economic insight and sensitivity analysis. There are certain things you will not see in their importance in the primal models that we have done. But they are going to be very important in the dual analysis. Now, do you remember there is also the concept of duality in economics? In economics, we can, from cost minimization, we can have, you know, output maximization or profit maximization. We can use a concept of duality in minimizing to get a production, you know, function or a cost minimizing, you know, model. And then from that, we'll be able to generate a, revenue or profit maximizing model. We have all the all, a minimization and max, maximization principle. But in linear programming, there's one key important thing you want to note from the onset. If the primal model that we did is a maximization, and you might know that we did a lot of maximization, then the dual will be a minimization. If the dual is a cost minimizing, the primal will be a maximization. Okay. So take an example like this. Take example like what we have on the screen. You are maximizing Z. Okay. Let me see if I can move this so that it's not too big. There we go. You are maximizing Z. And this Z is equal to C1 X1 plus C2 X2. These C's are the coefficients. And the X's are the decision variables. All the way up to the number of Subject to some constraint, but look at a constraint. You have a11 x1, a12 x2, all the way to a1n xn minus less or equal to b b1. Now, if you look at the a, watch the vertical movement of the a's. You have a11, a21, all the way up to am1. So you can see that these ones, these coefficients, the way they are arranged here they will switch in the dual. So in the dual, the coefficients that are vertical here will become the dual horizontal. And then the horizontal ones here, the A11, A12, A1, and they will become the dual vertical. Now sometimes it sounds a little bit complex, except to do an example. So let's take the example of this. This is maximizing Z. But watch here, we are minimizing W in the dual. The dual is a minimization of the maximized primer. So it's the same thing, but watch the way the movement is because it's a movement that guides you. The minimization for the, which is a dual for the primer above, the dual here is W, okay, B1, Y1. So instead of the X1s, we have the Y1s to represent the decision variables here. So what are their decision variables here? Because they may be slightly different interpretations. Now this B1, B2, B3, B4, up to Bm, watch the primer. They are the right-hand side of the constraints. So the right-hand side of the constraints become the decision variables in the dual. So in the primer, the right-hand side of the constraint becomes the decision variables of the constraint. Okay, so that's the first thing to note. Second, 
Second thing to note are the coefficients in the const in the constraints. The a11, a12, a13, a14, am1. These coefficients in the first constraint they are actually coming from the vertical section of the primer. The numbers, the coefficients of the vertical section. They are the ones that are arranged in the That one will also be the second version of the coefficient of the. Now, one last thing is the. I told you that the right hand side of the constraints here, it will become the decision variables in the dual. And then the decision variables in the primer, the C1, the C2, they will also become the right. Another thing is that in the primal, you have less than, less than most of the time. Now, if it is a less than in the primal, it becomes a greater than in the dual. If it is a less than in the primal, it becomes a greater than in the dual approach. So that is the few things you need to know. And then, of course, the same non-negativity constraint will hold in both cases, the non-negativity constraint will hold. So the key point is that the right hand side of the primal constraint and its decision variables in the objective function will swap in the, in the dual minimization. And the coefficients in the constraints, the horizontal numbering of the coefficient will swap with the vertical numbering in the dual as well. These are the two main differences. Let's take an so, after all the things that you have here, I've explained them. I've explained all of them. Let's take a typical example of what you know. You all remember this. Okay. I'm going to let you convert this from the primal. And this is, of course, the primal LPD. We're going to convert this to the dual. Okay. So, let's write it down. Let's write it down. I'm going to take a situation here and we're going to write it down right here. Okay. So we have the Z max. We have the Z max. And this was equal to 40x1 plus 50x2. Right. And this was subject to. Then you have another version which was 4x1. 4x1 plus 3x2 less or equal to 120 gallons. And then you have the non negativity constraint seated right here. This is a farm organa limited. Now, I told you that we are going to convert this into a dual form. We want to master this. The dual formulation, we will start with W min. Okay. W, let me use a different um, formula so that it will help us to follow quickly. So you have W min. And this will be equal to, we are going to use Y to represent the decision variables here. Okay. So what do you think will be the first number that will come? How will we now write with a Y one, with a Y? Oh, by the way, you will only know that you are dealing with how many of the Ys by looking at how many of the constraints. So if the constraints are four, then we are going to be dealing with four Ys. If the constraints are two, like what we have here, then we are going to deal with two Ys. So who can tell me how we should do this formulation? Who can, yes. Okay, maybe the first one. Okay, very good. The first one I can do it for you. So let's let's tr try that. So we said that the right hand side will become the con the coefficient. So this forty and that of the one twenty 
they are the ones we are going to use to write our constraint here. So it's going to be 40 y1 plus 120 y2. Okay. Subject to the right hand side of the constraint, if it is a less than or equal to, it will be greater than or equal to. So we want to write that first greater than or equal to, okay, like that. And then remember that is also going to be the decision variables here. And again, the number of decision variables will define how many constraints you should have. Okay. So we are going to have how many decision variables? We're going to have 40 on the right hand side and then 50 on the right hand side here. Then we come to the left hand side of the constraint. And in writing the left hand side of the constraint, we indicated that the values that are in front of the coefficients the values in front of the constraint variables, like the one and then this four, okay, the values. These values, they are now going to be the constraints in the horizontal fashion. Okay, and it's going to be y's. It's going to be y, 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 y. Not x, x, x. It's going to be y, y, y. So how would you think this constraint will have to be written? Now, this constraint, the 40 on the right hand, is Yogo. It's Yogo. If you check it, the 40 is Yogo and the 50 is Choco. So the same way, anything that has Yogo, X1, X1, we go with it. So we are going to have Y, 1, Y1, okay, plus 4, Y2. Referring to the coefficients in front of this. Then the second constraint to be these ones okay it will be these numbers there so that will be two y1 plus three y2 okay and so that becomes the second constraint and then of course your non-negativity constraint must come which is y1 comma y2 greater or equal to zero so what you've done is that you've converted this primal model, this is primal, and you've converted it into the dual model. But you see, converting this is a mathematical injunction. So you are following the principle of what you've taught, but you've got to understand what it means. And for me, that's important. The practical meaning of what you've written are important. So the first thing you want to note down is this. What do the Y's mean? What do the Y's mean? These Y's in their different column here. So when you look at the Y's, what do they mean? Okay. So these Y's, what do they stand for? What does Y1 mean? And what does Y2 mean? It's important. Okay. Remember, this was Farmer Ghana Limited, which we know of. Okay. And these were the available available gallons the first one was available hours okay so this was hours of labor and this was gallons of milk okay. so now we want to know what do they mean in here in terms of the y what does the y mean well, look at it carefully this this y refers to the price because remember it's multiplying what labor the so the Y here is referring to the price that you pay for labor. So one Y is going to be the price you pay for one hour of labor. Because remember, the labor too has got its value. And you've got to pay a price for using that labor. Okay. So let me write it here. The Y1 is equal to the price that you have to pay. Okay. Or uh, you've already paid, whichever one it is, the price paid for one labor hours used. One labor hours. So the price you pay for that. Okay. The price you pay for that. So every labor. So eventually, our goal in this minimization is to know the price. That's why they dwell. The dwell here means value, price. Okay. 
the value you attach. You see, the dual is looking at not what you are producing, which was in the primal, but the dual is looking at the, the costs or the value that you have to generate to use those resources. Okay? So it's the resources, the value that you have to incur to be able to produce that. Okay? Sometimes we call it a shadow price or the dual value. The dual value. You might remember that in the primal, we were finding the shadow price. You remember the shadow price? Okay. I remember the values of the shadow price, but do you remember the values of the shadow price? Okay, those shadow prices, that's what is being referred to as the Y. So what is the shadow price? What is the price? What is the value per one hour of labor used? And then, of course, the Y2 will be what? The price you paid, the shadow price you paid for one gallon of milk used. Okay. So Y2 will be the price paid... You got to understand these two meanings. These are the first two meanings that I wanted to understand here before we even proceed with the others. Because if you don't get this, it won't be clear. So if you don't understand this, let me know by raising your hand. I'll clarify it for you before we move on again. So these resource prices are important. These resource prices, okay, the Y1 that you are seeing here, and then the Y2 that you are seeing here, these resource prices. They are very important. They should be determined. Your goal is to find them by solving the dual equation that we have here. Okay. Now, let's try to make sense then of the objective function. Now that we know the y's, okay, what does 40y1 and 120 40 y1 plus 120 y2 mean what does that mean what do you think i mean it's good to think before we are told what, what what is the interpretation of that it is of course the objective function the minimizing objective function but what does it mean what does it mean what does it mean what does it mean okay well, I mean, who is bold enough? This time I need a hand raised. Who is bold enough? Um, Amana, what does it mean? What does this mean? It sounds quite a, a very complex situation. Um, sir, please help us. Okay, I will help you. That's why you're here. Okay. It is a clear, systematic indication that you need help. You are drowning and you need help, and the help you will get. Okay, so I will explain that to you. But I want you to pay attention to this explanation because you gotta you gotta make sense of other ones in this case. Now, I told you that this Y1 is a price you pay for using labor. And the Y2 is a price you pay for using gallons of milk. So obviously. Sir, please, you are breaking a bit. The connection keeps breaking. Oh, really? Yes, please. Hold on. So, the meaning of the 40Y1 and the 120Y2, they come from the way you understand this very example. This very example of the Y1. Y1 is a price you pay for using one hour of labor, the price you pay for using um, a gallon of milk. That is a Y2. So the 40 Y1 will be the total price you pay for using all of the labor. The total price you pay for using all of the labor. 
and then the 120 y2 is the total price you pay for using all of the um, the gallons of milk remember and so on the basis of this we can say that the whole thing there the 40 y1 plus a 120 y2 refers to the total price that should be paid for all the resources the total price needed to pay for all the resources so this is the total price the total price needed to pay for all the resources used so that's it that's it you got to understand these two interpretations i'm giving the y1 the y2 and then the all of that so that's the total price that you have to pay for all of this okay so we've been able to explain this objective fund and of course if it is a total price that you pay for using the resources your goal will be to minimize those costs those price the, the input prices now let's go to the next one what does the first constraint mean the first constraint let me just go back First constraint mean okay y one y one plus four y two that constraint what what does that mean what does that mean okay let me just use this one because we constraint the first constraint it took its premises from fan yogo don't worry, don't forget about that and this second one took its premise from fan choco so remember this one is like choco so what does that mean choco if you are to take the whole of the constraints here what does that mean now this is this is a little bit tricky but you can get it you can get it so I'm going to explain the 2y1 plus 3y2 greater or equal to 50. I'm going to explain it. And the key point is that resources prices must be set high enough to induce the company to sell. So if you look at these um, price, look at the value. We have 50 Ghana cities, Choco. So what this means is that I need you, remember we indicated that the Y1 here is a price you pay for using the resource to produce fan choco here. The price you pay for using the resource, what resource? Using the hours. So the Y1 here is the price you pay for using the hours. And then the Y2, the two is the number of, the number of hours of labor that was actually used the number of hours of labor that was you know um, handled with dealt with and therefore you are going to incur a particular kind of price okay you're going to incur a particular kind of price and honestly if if farmer Ghana limited if they really want to be able to be motivated to sell to sell the fine choco then the price that is attached to the fan choco has to be what has to be very high so let's make it an assumption suppose that a, an entrepreneur wants to buy all of the resources all of the resources which is what the labor and that of the capital you want to buy all everything the question is this he must determine what price to pay for a unit of each of the resources okay he must determine that entrepreneur must determine the price to pay for a unit of the resources and the price he pays is the y1 and the y2 here okay so that's a price that the person must determine to pay now here is a question let's say that the entrepreneur will have to pay 50 ghana cities which is a what choco? A fine choco, if you look at it. 
this 50 Ghana cities is a price you pay for one sachet of fan choco. And that is a price that the entrepreneur will have to pay for him to combine those resources. Okay. So for him to be able to give you the resources that you need to go and use it to produce that your fan choco, for him to give you that. So you have an entrepreneur sitting somewhere. For that entrepreneur to give Farm Mill Ghana Limited those resources, what resources? The combination of the resources of um, milk and that of hours of labor. For him to give you two hours of labor and three gallons of milk, which are those coefficients you see here, two and three, for him to do that, you have to pay him. You have to pay him. You don't just get it free. So, so the price you got to pay to be able to get three hours of labor and three, two hours of labor and three gallons of milk, that price you got to pay is the 50 cities that you have on the right. He will not take any, um, I mean, if you come less, fine. Okay. So, so if you look at the left, this side here, you can see that he will not take anything less than 50,000. It is greater than or equal to his 50 cities or more that's what i want i want more of that but then the minimum i will accept for you to pay me is a 50 ghana city so the two y1 and blah 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 it is it is what you are actually going to pay for to be able to get those uh, that resource okay those resource of labor which is the y1 the price you pay for the labor and then that of the price for the milk okay so you need that two y1 three y2 to be able to produce a functional and so the price you got to pay for these resources should be 50 or more but of course we don't now we don't know how the price you're going to pay for the labor hours which is a y1 and we don't know the price you're going to pay for the milk gallons of milk we don't know that but if we happen to know the price we pay you multiply that you wouldn't want anything less than 50 cities that is if you were the one supplying those resources it's a very important thing so if if that particular entrepreneur who is supplying so it's that entrepreneur his job is to be supplying resources supplying the gallons of milk and the hours of labor to this farmer okay. if it wants okay you desire to use those resources to produce a choco. Okay. You have to pay him that amount of 50 to be able to want to sell those resources to you. Now, the entrepreneur is offering you two Y1 plus the three Y2. That's what the entrepreneur is offering you for the resources that you want to collect to produce a fine choco. So, and so you will have to choose the Y1 and the Y2 in such a way that they will satisfy his requirement of 50 or more. This is the second constraint that you are talking about. Of course, you can use the same reasoning to do that of the first constraint. Okay? That the resources that I need, the hours of labor and the gallons of milk that I really, really have to be able to gather to give to you for you to go and produce your fun jogo here. I will need you to pay me a price of no less than 40 cities. Okay. And so on the basis of that, you should go and select the price you gotta pay. And then let me know. And then after that, I'll pay you. So that's the same principle of price. So what this means is that the Y1 and the Y2 must satisfy the constraint. Okay. So, so if you can't go and say that, okay, I'm going to pay this amount to you, and then it doesn't satisfy the constraint, it's below the 40 cities. It shouldn't be below. It should be more. Or a minimum of 40. So, in general, the solution to the dual programming problem does will, will yield prices. Not like the previous one where it was yielding decision variables. Here it is going to yield shadow prices for the hours of labor and for the gallons of labor. So the resources are important. That's the key in 
this dual optimization problem. The resources are the focus. But in the primal, <laughs> it's not the resources. It is the items you are producing, not the resources you are using to produce the items. And this price you got to pay is what is known as the shadow price. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to give you some scenario and I want you to convert it to me. You're going to show me the answers on the screen. Okay. And I'm going to give you this equation. So, I want you to look at this equation. This is a maximization problem 60x1 plus 30x2 plus 20x3. Yours is to convert this from the primal to the dual for me. Okay, so please start. Convert it from the primal to the dual for me. Okay, so let's look at the dual theory. The duality theory. If the primal linear model, linear problem is unbounded, the dual linear problem is infeasible. If the dual is unbounded, the primal is infeasible. We've said this before. And guys, please note that the primal and the dual, they can switch. If one is a primal, the other is dual. If the one is dual, the other is primal. Okay. But we always use what we did today as the dual. If one is unbounded, the other is infeasible. We know this from the regular types of linear programming about unboundedness and infeasibility. Do you remember infeasibility? Infeasibility is when there is no solution. Unboundedness is when the linear programming is what is not closed, and so you can have multiple of the answers happening. So that is a principle. There. It's, it's a bit of a problem in linear problem. linear problem. Then there's another theory known as the theorem of complementary slacking. The theory of complementary slacking. It says that. What it does is that it connects the optimal primal and the dual solutions together. So let's assume that. And, and I need to show you with this. So let me annotate this point. Okay. Let's assume that you have a primal model. And this is a normal maximization problem. And the variables are the x's, x1, x2, up to xn. And then you have m less than or equal to as the constraints. Let's assume that the S1, S2, S3 are the primal slacks, something you already know from the standard form. The dual becomes a normal minimization problem with the variables wise and n greater or equal to the constraint. Whereas in the primal, it was m less or equal to the constraint. Here it is greater or equal to the And then, because this primal will have slacks, the E1, E2 up to EN will be the dual excesses. The opposite of the slacks are the excesses variables. Then, if this is all holding, then the complementary slackness theorem says this. And it says that we should let X be the following in the matrix. And that should be a feasible optimal solution. And then the Ys become a feasible dual solution. Matrix is a primal optimal and Y matrix is a dual optimal. If and only if the slacks are zero, of course, the weighted slacks are zero. And of course, if the weighted excesses are also zero. So the complementary slackness theory simply say that there will be a complement of whatever is happening in the primal with that of whatever is happening. Okay, now I want you to recall this primal model. We've been dealing with it many, many times. This is a primal. This is a primal. We have even converted it into the dual. And this is a dual. The dual is what we have here. Okay. And we've also gone through the interpretation of it all. We can run this in Excel. We can solve this dual in Excel. You can do it later. I want to just show you quickly the results. This is what happened. If you put everything, just as we have always been formulating, okay, 
we put this one into the result and then you run this result now you're going to run them the same way as it was in the manner in which you have formulated them here so in this case the object coefficients are 40 and 20 and that is why here you will see 40 and 20. You see 40 and 20. now if you run this this becomes the result watch the result you are still going to get the same value of the 1330 1360. Do you remember this was the Z value for the primal? Well, it's the same W value for the dual. Now, what does this mean? Well, remember the total definition we gave for the W. We said that the W becomes the total price you have to pay for using the resources. And if you're able to use the resources fully, the total price you pay is 1360. And that is still the same profit you are going to get if you were to fully utilize those resources. So you can see that there is that kind of complementary, you know, analysis in there. We also mentioned that the shadow price that we found, if you can remember, this was the shadow price, okay, in the primal that we did before. That shadow price happens to be the objective um, the final value of the objective coefficient here. Okay. And so the way you interpret them now becomes now 16 is the price you pay for using fine choco, fine yogo. 16 cities now becomes the price you pay. And 6 cities now becomes the price you pay for using what? The resources to produce the choco. And so if you now want to know the actual price you paid for each resources, that is what you have here. And so you paid 40 CDs for using that one hour of labor and four gallons of milk to produce that fun yogo that you did. The price you paid for that was 40. The minimum price that they were expecting that you pay was 40 and you paid that minimum price like that. If there were more that you pay, that is an excess, which you go to that guy. Okay. The choco too was the same thing. The minimum price you paid was exactly what you were given. So Excel is able to give you back the dual price. But the most important thing is this, and this is what I want you to note here. I can tell you to be able to use the dual. Now watch carefully. I can tell you to use the dual shadow price to find the total price paid. Okay, so what I mean is I can give you the normal primal model, the normal primal model, and then tell you that find the overall, okay, the overall, you know, total price paid for using those resources. And I will not give you the objective coefficient for the primal. I will not give you those objective coefficients for you to go and multiply the objective coefficient with the final value because that is going to give you an easy way. I will delete those objective coefficients and then, and then I expect that you go and use this shadow price here and convert the whole thing into a primer, into a dual, and then you will multiply that by the coefficient. Okay, so 16 multiplied by 40 and then 6 multiplied by 20 so that means that you need to know the right hand side of the constraint in the primal you need to know that they are 40 and 120 and then multiply the shadow price by them and then you get it now what i'm saying is this is it's very easy to do that because when you go down if you can remember your primal your primal okay let me try and show you this prime. So this was the solution that we had. Okay. How do you now get? Suppose I delete this 40 and 50. I deleted the 40 and the 50, which are the objective coefficients. But you have the final values here. But I tell you to find find the overall profit. Or I even tell you to find the total price paid for the labor. And the capital used the total price paid for the resources for you to be able to get that the total price which is the same as the 
profit value, you need to now come to the shadow price here, which is 16 and 6. Multiply each one by the 40 and the 120, and that will give you the same thing as taking the 24 multiplied by the 40 and 8 multiplied by the 50. Isn't it? That's the beauty of the shadow price and the duality analysis. So it is the same thing. You can use that same thing to get a 1,600, 1,360. And that is a beautiful thing that you can do right there. So you can see that the Y1 is 16, the Y2 is 6. Okay, these are the dual feasible values. And like we've indicated, the dual feasible solution has a dual objective function value of 1.6. So I'm going to give you an assignment. And what I want you to do is to try and then handle this assignment. It's a very loaded assignment, which I want you to do. Okay, and I want you to do this assignment in all the knowledge you've acquired in this bogus manufacturer's desk tables and chairs the manufacturer of each type of furniture requires lumber and two types of skilled labor finishing and carpentry so those are the constraints the amount of each resource needed to make each type of furniture is given below okay so the amount of resources needed to you know produce the desk the table the chairs the resources are Lumber, finishing, and then carpentry. Okay. Now, the amount, the currently 48 board feet of lumber are available. 20 finishing hours are available. 8 carpentry hours are available. Or a deck sells for 60, a table sells for 30, a chair sells for 20. Those are the decision variables. Bogas believe that demand for decks and chairs is unlimited. The demand for chairs is unlimited. But at most, this is a constraint parameter, at most five tables can be sold. Boga want to maximize total revenue. Now look at the question. Formulate a primal linear programming model for Bogas. Convert the primal model to the standard form. Solve the linear programming problem using Excel. Identify which resources are efficient. Do the slacks make sense? Justify. If the table sells for 35 cities, how much more or less sales revenue will Bogas make? What optimal solution did you obtain? This is sensitivity analysis. Now suppose 10 types of furniture could be manufactured. To obtain an optimal solution, how many types of furniture at most will be If the price of tables increases to 33, should Boga still produce two decks and eight chairs? This is a beautiful lesson about the optimality condition when you do the sensitivity. What is the implication of selling tables at 40? Suppose that 22 finishing hours are available. Instead of what is there, what happens to the current optimal solution? This is why you use the shadow price. Suppose price of tables increase by 2, not by, this time 2, 43. And because of changes in production technology, a table required 5 board feet of lumber, 2 finishing hours, 2 carpentry hours. Will this change the optimal solution of total revenue to the Bogas problem? Now, suppose Bogas is considering making S2s. So this is a fourth variable. Okay, S2 S2 sells for 5, 15 cities requires one bottle feed lumber, one finishing hour, one carpentry hour, should the company manufacture any stools? Now, Bogas Furniture is considering a manufacturing home computer tables. A home computer sells, it just says the previous one. A home computer sells for 36 series, uses six bottle lumber, two finishing hours, two carpentry, should the company manufacture any home ta computer tables? Formulate a dual linear programming for the problem. What do the decision variables in the dual for Bogas mean? Is your formulation, in your formulation, what is the total resource price? Interpret the first constraint. Solve the dual. Using Excel, find and interpret the shadow price. What does the shadow price of lambda imply? Is it reasonable? If 18 finishing hours were available, 
what will Pogas be revenue? If 30 carpentry hours were available, why couldn't the shadow price for the carpentry constraint be used to determine the new Z value? Suppose Pogas is considering manufacturing a full stool X4, a full stool sells for this and uses one bottle of lumber, one bottle of finishing lumber. Does the current basis remain optimal? It might look to you that it's the same as the previous one, but it is not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your assignment. It is very loaded. That is why you've been given enough time. God be with you in all your thinking faculty.